Well, thank you very much for both being with us. I mean, how, how was it watching again? Um, I don't know when the last time you saw it was. I mean, have you watched it in terms of for preparation for the, the show before? Or? Uh, sure. I, I wa I'd, I'd watched it many years ago and watched it again before we started rehearsals. Um, I knew that Enda Walsh, who wrote the book for the musical, um, in as much as it's a musical, for the piece, um, based most of what he did on Walter Tevis's novel, as much as the yeah. film, but it was you know, irresistible to watch it, and there were certainly some you know, things that I think the production takes in terms of, um, well, he drinks a lot of gin still. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's quite, um, you know, Lazarus is not uh, that straightforward a piece, uh, but then again, neither is that. It certainly wasn't. So, uh, but yeah, it's. Um, it, it, I always get something out of out of um, looking at it, even though it's maybe not um, strict in terms of uh, its being source material for the show. We start um, in the present day in New York, and he's um, in a sort of self-imposed exile in a penthouse apartment in New York City, um, and hasn't really evolved much beyond where we see him at the end of this. But he still wants to go home. He does still want to go home, yes. Okay. Robert, um, you already have or have an existing relationship with David Bowie, and he spoke to you about this project. Can you just tell us a little bit about your relationship with him and where this came out of? Well, I, I, I've known, I knew him for, um, madly, about 40 years. We met when I was 23 in would have been about 27, I guess, 28. And um, then we didn't stay in touch that much. But when he went and lived in New York, I used to do plays that would transfer sometimes to New York. And he and I reconnected then. And he, would, he loved the theater. And he would come and see the plays. And we'd talk about them. And he'd meet the directors and the writers and people. And he kept saying, I want to do something in the theater, and I, I'd really love to. And um, about 11 years ago, he gave me um, a copy. I, I found it the other day. I've actually got it here of um, The Man Who Fell to Earth, the, the novel. And um, he inscribed it to me, and it says, Robert, I'm not a human being at all. <laughs> Thomas Jerome Newton. And then he goes, shh. David Bowie, um, and and I found that the other day because it, it nothing happened. That was two thousand and five, and then he came over to London to do uh, to see the exhibition at the V&A with his family, and I went and had tea with him in his hotel, and we tried to find various things we wanted to do, but nothing had ever gelled. And then he said, I know what I want to do. And I said, great, what is it? And he said, well, all I know is it's called Lazarus, and it's based on Thomas Jerome Newton. And now you've got to go out and find the people to make that happen with me, which is what we did. And that took a year to put together, and then we did a workshop in New York. And that a year after that, we did the show with Michael at the New York Theatre Workshop, and that was at the end of last year, just before David died. And the turnaround for that, in theatre terms, was incredibly swift, wasn't it? Um, was that because you knew that there was a kind of ticking clock on it, or was that just the way it ended up? No, originally there was no ticking clock, but he said he want, it was the next thing he wanted to do, along with an album I didn't know it was going to be Black Star, because he kept everything very separate. Uh, but I knew that, that uh, Lazarus was something very important to him, and I knew that Ender is a quick writer, and that he and David would probably spark off each other, which they did. And then when we got Eva Van Hove involved, he's very amazingly clever and quick at putting things together. So the whole thing remarkably came together very quickly. And then David got ill again, and then he said, you've got to get it on. And so we did. And Michael, at what point did you become involved with this project? Um, I wasn't involved in the first workshop that Robert mentioned. I um, just so happened to be having a lunch with Ivo Van Hove. Um, 
we were represented by the same agent, lucky for me, and a little bird had told me about this production. Um, I'll say a little bird because it was top secret. I wasn't supposed to know about it, but at the end of my uh, lunch with Evo, I let him know about this conversation I'd had with the little bird and told him that if there were any availability, I would be thrilled to be considered. And uh, that coincided with me doing Hedwig and the Angry Inch on Broadway, so that was a very well-produced um, glittery audition, I guess, um, that Robert attended and um, Evo came. David wasn't able to come. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what led to me getting the job. I think uh, over in the UK, because we're so used to your kind of dramatic roles on film and TV, I think some people in the UK will be very surprised by the fact that obviously you've got this sort of Broadway career with Cabaret in Chicago and Hedwig, um, because I think could have, you wouldn't have been the obvious choice for a lot of people over here, but actually, as we've seen from your performance at the Mercury Awards and so forth, actually it works incredibly well. I mean, I wonder if you just tell us a little bit about sort of the thought process of getting into that kind of character. Well, I certainly imagined that if they hired me, they weren't hiring someone to simula simulate David Bowie's physical presence or mannerisms necessarily. Um, and I know that Evo was interested in me personalizing the character as much as I could and, and was interested in me playing Thomas Jerome Newton, not David Bowie playing yeah. Thomas Jerome, Jerome Newton. So, um, um, I uh, had some time with the music um, before I met David, um, and, and of course his musical sensibility um, informed the way I approached the music just because his sensibility is so singular. Um, it would be difficult not to um, phrase things the way he phrases things. Or, and I'm so familiar with it that that's kind of in me anyway. And maybe there's something about the timbre of my voice that is enough like his that I don't really have to try to make myself sound like him. I think I just kind of do um, somewhat. Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't um, feel obliged to do an imitation and any, any um, influence was inevitable because his sensibility infuses the whole piece and certainly the music. And his involvement in the production, kind of beyond sort of delivering the script and, and the songs, um, I mean, what, was he kind of part of that kind of rehearsal process in a sort of a hands-on way, or, or did he sort of just then leave it to Evo and, and the rest of the team? He, w he was involved very much in the auditions. He, he saw everyone who came in to audition. I mean, Michael exactly. met him and, and had to... <laughs> Paul Mann had to sing for him. Yeah, the first time I met him, I, um, I met him in our musical director, Henry Hayes, little East Village apartment, and sang through stuff with Henry, and then David came, and it was the first time I'd met him, and uh, we exchanged some pleasantries, and he looked and smelled amazing. And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I turned off a part of my brain just to sort of get through it, but he was so um, gracious and did somehow, you know, had an energy that unplugged your impulse to bow before him as an icon and recognize him as a collaborator who was very enthusiastic and I really relaxed and then Henry played the opening chords of the first song I was to sing when we got down to that and I got really nervous and David said yes sing my songs for me now you know he kind of <laughs> he named the sort of insane absurdity of the moment and that put me at ease and uh, I, I got through it, but uh, but I, I I kind of felt when that was over that I had nothing left to fear, you know. If I sat there with him sitting on the couch singing his songs for him, if I could do that, then I'd be all right. And um, towards the later stages, you know, in terms of the last kind of couple of years, there was an awful lot of kind of secrecy in terms of people didn't know about the Black Star album, they didn't know about a lot of the projects, which is kind of. Um, amazing really in this kind of era of social media where everything now is kind of immediately out there. Was there a lot of secrecy around the original production of Lazarus when you debuted in, in New York? Um, it, well he liked to keep things as close to him and the group of people he worked with as possible because he um, just felt that that kept the pressure off and that was one of the reasons that we wanted to do the show in a 199 seat theatre in the East Village 
rather than in some big glitzy production um, because we didn't quite know what it was and we didn't want to make a big hoo-ha about it. And in fact, I think we kind of succeeded in that, although the moment somebody you know, writes down new musical by David Bowie obviously gets a lot of attention. But David was very, although he's an amazing performer, he was a really shy man. And he liked to protect his own privacy as much as possible and that of his family. So he, he, he was keen to keep it, it's not secret, but he was keen to keep it discreet. And, and the production that we're going to see in London shortly, is that changed from the New York version or is it pretty much the No, it's the same. It's the same. It's what he saw and what he loved. So we don't need to... Ch I mean, if he was happy, I'm happy. Yeah. Um, and, and one thing that Michael just touched on before was that actually uh, the character of Newton in the production comes as much from the book as it does from the film. Um, yeah, that's true. I think that's absolutely true. And um, in terms of um, sort of beyond this, I mean, I, I, I guess at the moment you're just looking about the London production, yeah. but is this something that will continue and travel? And, and I mean, could it even be a film in itself in, in the future? I, you never know. I mean, I just get it on in London and hope for the best, and then we'll see what happened. You know, a year ago we didn't know they'd come here, so making plans, you know, you always make a plan and then it goes wrong. So I tend not to make the plan and then you can't be disappointed. I, I think that David um, definitely could identify with the character of Thomas Newton. Um, I don't think he really thought he was an alien, but I think he liked the idea that people might think he was. Um, that amused him. I think watching this film again that you can see somebody who um, gets thrown into a world, suddenly makes a huge amount of money, has everything available to them, and can you know, basically do what the hell they like and fucks up in a way, is something that if you're a rock star, and he was at his age, you can totally identify with. And the isolation, and all of those things I completely understand. And it was actually great to see the film today to, to, to kind of connect all of that. So it, Newton is obviously someone, a character that he loved. Otherwise, he wouldn't have you know, given me books and got the rights to the, to the novel and kept those rights for many years, which he did, and, and then decided <coughs> towards the end of his life that that was the one thing, the one musical he wanted to write. So I think it must have been pretty connected to him. But um, he's an interesting character, Newton, and, and, and has similarities, yes. But David was um, much saner. <laughs> uh, I would say it was Nick Rogue's vision. I mean, given that he's a brilliant cameraman and, and a wonderful director and a huge, with a huge imagination, I would say that's his vision and that David was a part of it, not the influence for it, but I have no idea. <laughs> Nor that do would I. be my guess. <laughs> Somewhat, but not, not hugely, because our production takes place in one room. It doesn't go anywhere else. It takes place in his apartment, and everything that happens is kind of in his imagination. Yeah. There is a huge television screen. That is definitely kind of nicked. There's a lot of projected There's images. A lot of projected images. Uh, but beyond that, no. And that kind of non-linear kind of storytelling approach. Ours is a bit more so, linear than is this. this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was thrilled to see yeah, that. Yeah. We're, we make a lot of sense. <laughs> After he died, um, it just so happened that we woke up to the news the very morning that we got together and recorded the cast album, which was um, eerily appropriate. Uh, but um, we had another week and a half to two weeks of performances, and 
everything was recontextualized and every bit of the show was heard anew and heard with, with this new hindsight. Um, and I think at that point, yeah, there were resonances all over the place. Um, the songs were selected by Ender Walsh, obviously in conjunction with, with David, but when uh, Ender and I first, the first time David met with Ender and I was there, he gave us uh, six CDs of a lot of tracks and said to Ender, you choose um, what you want that's going to fit the story that you're going to write and then we'll discuss it. So he gave Ender pretty much carte blanche. Obviously, once Ender had chosen those songs, um, they discussed it, and David wrote four new songs, of which Lazarus is the one that is, is on Black Star, but the other three were only heard for the first time with Michael and the company, and then when the album comes out, the company sing the numbers that David wrote for the album, but David also has recorded them at the time he recorded Black Star, so they'll be on that album too. Was, was David involved in when the actual, well, with the new songs in particular, in terms of... Oh yeah, um, in the orchestrations, and and absolutely. Really worked closely with Henry Hay, who Michael said is the musical director, who who, who uh, David said, I want you to produce the cast album because you know what I'm doing. Well, you mentioned the theme of isolation before. Obviously, there's a degree, a large degree to which the show is a meditation on um, morality, uh, mortality rather, <laughs> uh, obviously, but, but it's also about Isolation. I came across an interview with, with David from the mid to late 70s in which he um, expressed his ongoing interest in isolation and the interior worlds that we create and live in and live in as completely and extensively as the actual real world. And I think Thomas Newton is in a place where that's all he has. Uh, and so... Um, you see a sort of increasingly um, intense and embroidered fantasy world versus the real world that he kind of wants to disengage from. So a lot of, as, as Robert said, the, the set is meant to evoke a skull. You're inside his head and um, it's a bit of a fever dream. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I'm 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 reluctant to tell you exactly where it goes um, because I'm not sure. Uh, you know, it's it's there's there's an intentional ambiguity that even from night to night is in play. Um, um, three dimensional three-dimensionality, um, <laughs> beige clothing, um, he sings. Um, what did I add to the character? I mean, I added whatever, you know, Evo, as I said earlier, encouraged me to, you know, he's not interested in his actors presenting ideas or simulating anything. He wants um, very, specific and visceral and personal work to be done. So, you know, I don't know that I could really describe it to you, but um, I, my, I brought myself to it, I suppose. It feels, yeah, I mean, it, certainly the way the production is done feels very contemporary. It feels like it's happening in New York now. Um, it doesn't have any throwback to, you know, odd hair and clothes. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't try to comment on mass media, though. It, it, you know, it, it, if somebody uses a cell phone, it's because they do. It's not because they're trying to make some point about cell phones. 
Although, as you know, but David was you know, into the internet long before many people. Um, but it doesn't, no, it doesn't try to jump into all of that. But it, it's happening now as opposed to happening then. That's, that's really the main difference. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he, was, he was literally over the moon about it. I mean, he, he loved seeing it that night. And I saw him a couple of days later, and he was still buzzing with excitement. He was, it was a great joy to see him so happy.